Welcome in Rose City to Soccer Made in Portland. I'm Ryan Clark, joined by Chris Reifer, as always, on this sunny Thursday morning here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, not sunny times on the field last night, although the sun was out and, and the weather was cooperating in uh, in Colorado for, for the Timbers, who finished off a 0-0 draw there. Uh, and then on the weekend, the, the Thorns, another worrisome time in terms of weather but they were able to play the full match in gotham uh albeit unfortunately a yeah unfortunately for the thorns a 2-1 loss uh at, at a gotham team that despite you know missing its world cup players put in a really strong performance and um you know proved that they were on the level of, of this thorn squad um and right now above it so you know we can we can start there we can start with the thorns um since since that was very clearly the more eventful and important game uh, between the two teams this week, Uh, you know, two, one loss at Gotham issues, defending in transition continue to be something that pops up consistently for this team. They play their players so high. And then, you know, as I I believe it was Megan Klingenberg uh, put it, sometimes we forget to, that we also have to get back and defend. And, you know, whether that was Klingenberg or someone else, I may be misremembering, but that is an extremely apt quote to the issues that the Thorns are facing as a team right now, regardless of the personnel that's on the field. You know, this wasn't just a problem as soon as Sophia Smith and the and the gang of World Cup players disappeared. Uh, this is a serious issue. And Becky Sauerbrunn is not going to be the the save all for, for this problem. She is an excellent player, a historically great player. But defending is is something that has emerged as a genuine weakness of this Thorns team this season. And yes, you know, they are blowing the doors off the rest of the teams in the league when it comes to scoring goals. Um, not anymore. You think, well, not in, not as much. Not anymore. reasonable. But, uh, but in terms of the statistical categories, you know, they're number one in basically everything from an attacking standpoint. And I think they are number one in terms of overall talent in terms of their roster top to bottom in the NWSL. But all that being said, you know, these, these two matches without the world cup players were an important test. I think of, of this team's fortitude of its ability to um, respond to adversity and to, and to find ways to win despite lacking their top attacking talent. Um, and then they came up short and, you know, Mike Norris acknowledged that in his post game press conferences, he feels like they could have gotten three points definitely out of that KC game and at least a point out of that Gotham game. Uh, and they came out with zero in both of them. Um, so Chris, your thoughts on just a, a tough stretch for the thorns, but you know, whether or not it might be a bellwether for what's to come once, you know, everybody gets back. Uh- I don't think it's much of a bellwether for what's to come when everybody gets back. Uh, even to be honest, given the absences, I think if you ignore the score line and ignore the points and and look at just some of the play, it wasn't terrible. Uh, there there were some good moments, even in that Gotham game. I, I thought the Thorns created a decent number of chances. Abby Smith, the Gotham goalkeeper, had a really good game. Former Thorn, old friend, uh, had a really good game. Came up with a number of pretty big saves. Uh, that I think sort of preserved that result for uh, for Gotham, um, and 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 so you know I I think if you ignore the points and ignore the scoreline, you know there's nothing that causes enormous concern. The team has played okay, uh, especially given the absences. But the the shield race doesn't ignore the points. The the playoff race doesn't ignore the points. Those are based on the points. <laughs> And and dropping these two results, not getting anything out of these two league games that they are definitely going to play shorthanded. They're probably going to have one or two more at least with some shorthandedness. Uh, that matters. You know, the the Thorns were atop the table and now they're not. Uh, now they're one. I mean, they are one point off the top of the table. They are also one point off of being out of the playoff picture altogether. Well, actually, you know, just to just to touch on that um, four points off of the sixth spot where San Diego sits right now. Um, they, they were a little closer to, to being on the edge um, in terms of how tight those standings are. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're one point back of North Carolina um, right now for the top spot in NWSL. Everybody's played 15 games, so everything's equal 
right now in the league. Gotham's tied with the Thorns on points at 25, although the Thorns have a 10 better goal differential, so they got the tiebreaker there. Regardless of whoever they end up being tied with, you can probably guess that that goal differential is going to be a tiebreaker. The Thorns will win when the season is all said and done, barring any, you know, issues down the stretch. So you've got North Carolina one at 26 thorns and Gotham at two and three with 25 OL rain in fourth with 24 tied with Washington spirit. That's right. So they're, tw- they're, they're, they're one point out of sixth. Yes. One point, which um, would get them into the play in. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And you don't, you don't want to be in a scenario where you go on the road, right? And you'd it's, be on the road. Anything, throughout. Yeah. You'd be on the road throughout. Like, for the thorns, the the shield is important, but more important, I think, even than the shield to this group, um, is getting a top two seed to to have one home game to win to get into the NWSL championship. They want to repeat as champs. That's the easiest and and best path for them to do so. And this table is insanely tight. You know, the the waiver in six at twenty one points. Um, you got four points between yourself and the last playoff team in, and you know, one through five is separated by two points and it has been a constant shuffle and every team in that top five has at one point been at the top of the NWSL standings. Just as it was so, last year. And, yeah, and this is what we talked about at the, at the beginning of the season where, you know, we talked about how we thought the Thorns were really stacked, but that the league was really deep, that the top end of the league was was very, very deep, had a number of teams that could compete. And, and, you know, 2023 is shaping up much like 2022 did, uh, which is to say that they're just that the thorns, even as good as they are, and even as talented as they are, they don't have the luxury of dropping attainable points. And, you know, the simple reality is over the course of the last few weeks, they've dropped some attainable points and, 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 and that's that, that, that hurts. Uh, even if the play in light of the absences hasn't been so bad. Uh, even if there have been some players who have who who have shown fairly well in this period, uh, I I think the points matter, and, uh, and and so you know if if I'm the Thorns, that's the bigger concern for me. And you know they now have a few games in Challenge Cup that I think you can probably make the argument don't matter all that much, and are not critical games just given the way the Challenge Cup results have sort of gone to date. That's kind of in the rearview mirror. Uh, at this point, but they yeah, need the results don't matter. Yeah. Like the for straight up, those results do not matter. What matters, I think to this team and to the individual players is the way that they can develop in that stretch in order to, you know, have those players be ready to contribute when the, the stars come back. hundred percent. And, and to be ready to compete in those final league games before they, before they maybe get all those stars back. Uh, they'll probably have some back by the time they get back into, into league play, but probably not all of them. Uh, And yeah, I mean, it's also always a question when players get back from the World Cup, how healthy they're going to be, how exhausted they're going to be physically and mentally, emotionally, uh, because it's a really, really taxing tournament. And we've certainly seen in the past in World Cup years, players come back and not be the same because they're just wiped out. Uh, And that's totally understandable. That's not questioning anybody's work ethic or anything like that. They're just wiped out because they've thrown everything they have into into this tournament, uh, and and it's it's not like you can go play a World Cup final on a Sunday, hop on a plane, and always be sharp and ready to play an NWSL game on Wednesday. Uh, that's that's not how that goes uh, in in many many circumstances. And so, I think these next few games in Challenge Cup, even though the results don't matter uh, all that much, are going to be important. Because they're going to need some of these players to play significant roles going forward, even after they start welcoming some of the World Cup World Cup players back into the team. Uh, and, and so I think that's what they they need to prove. They need to prove that not only can they have good moments, and not only can they, you know, uh, w- with a with a blindfold on uh, with, to the scoreline, you know, have some moments in which they look good. But they, they can go out and get results and they can close out games uh, and, and they can defend well and they can do those kinds of things that you need to do to get points. Because at the end of the day, that's what matters. Uh, and, and they haven't done well in that regard in the last few weeks. Right. And I, I think that the KC game is a good example of positive development that you know Mike Norris wants to see despite a result that didn't go their way. And, and that hurts more because the result matters more 
in that regular season match and you want to get three points when you outshoot a team 26 to five, you definitely don't want to end up with zero the way that they did, which, you know, stinks for them. But um, in terms of development, that type of game, that type of performance where on the attack, they're throwing a ton at the wall and getting a lot of opportunities that, you know, they should convert, but will likely more often than not, you know, convert a few of those and and get a result that they need so you know performing like that and continuing to develop in that way and and um i i think that defensively especially the the development there and how they recover their defensive shape generally um maybe choosing to throw a little less at the wall just to give yourself some breathing room defensively so that Megan Klingenberg doesn't have to run 40 yards across the field at a full sprint every single time there's a counterattack or, you know, Emily Mangus is left on an Island where she has to move laterally with multiple extremely fast and athletic attacking players coming towards her. Um, I, I, you know, give those players some relief, maybe find different ways during these three challenge cup matches to, to, you know, develop that within your plan if you're Mike Norris um that that's the biggest focus but obviously there are other other ways in that these individual players can develop uh in these three matches which are on uh, July 21st 29th and then August 6th against San Diego Angel City and OL Reign all of whom you know have these mixed rosters you know have individual players that are talented but are, are good tests you know it's the west coast teams yeah, I, 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 absolutely. And for me, it, it boils down to connection between the back line and midfield. It's, it's what we've been talking about uh, all year long, where if you're pushing your fullbacks on and you're pushing all of your central midfielders, except Sam Coffey, uh, high into the tack, you're going to have these big spaces between between your midfield and attacking lines and, and your def- and the the remnants uh, uh, of your of your defense. And teams have repeatedly exploited that. I thought Gotham exploited it some, but not not a ton. Uh, certainly, the second goal is one where there's more space to to put a ball in uh, over the top than than the Thorns would have liked, uh, and, and and that's one that I think you can certainly sort of look back to these kinds of issues. The first goal, frankly, it was it was low block defending that the Thorns were just kind of asleep on. Ball comes across uh in 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 a bit of a switch uh just uh, uh above the 18 and the thorns are just super slow to react which makes it so that there's lots of time on the ball for uh Gotham to to pick out a cross they thorns ultimately got a deflection on it albeit it wasn't a great one sort of popped it up in the air and 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 old friend Allie Long finished it uh but i mean those are both moments in 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 which you know you've got both structural and just sort of like being switched on issues in, in in defense, and I think Thorns players have talked to both of, to both of those issues about what they need to clean up in defending, and I th- thought we saw them in in both instances. I thought Gotham deservedly won the game. I think on balance they were the better team uh, in, in in this last one, but that still was very much a game that the Thorns could have gotten a result out of if they're tighter defensively. Uh, they created enough to be competitive in in that game. And it's just taking those kinds of performances against, look, a good team on the road. And I think you'd probably say that Gotham is somewhat less hampered by the World Cup than the Thorns are. They're definitely hampered. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but the Thorns really have have been pretty gutted uh, in terms of uh, in, in terms of their stars. And I think Gotham is a little bit less so. Uh and you know, overall, that's a that's a road game against a good team. I think the Thorns can feel okay about the fact that they were competitive in it, but they can't feel okay about the result because there was more to get there. Just as there was more to get in the game against Casey the week before uh, at home, and 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 those hurt because uh, if those go a different way, the Thorns are sitting atop the table right now, and maybe even uh, with a little bit of daylight between them and the rest of the field, uh, depending on how, uh, how exactly those res- results shake out. And, and, and I think if, if you're Mike Norris and if you're the team, you're probably sitting there kind of ruining that a little bit. Yeah. Going forward is, is interesting for this team because you have those, those trio of challenge cup matches. Um, and you know, it, it by no means is going to just be those 
three matches that you're not going to be at full strength, right? We've talked about this before. The, the World Cup final, albeit a 3 a.m. Pacific time kickoff. Good Lord. I, I'm going to be probably staying up for that or I guess waking up early for that, depending on how I, I plan that day. But uh, 3 a.m. Pacific time kickoff on August 20th, right? U.S. has a pretty good chance to be there. Canada could be there. Um, you know, it's less likely, I think, that that Japan and Costa Rica are. But anything goes in this World Cup. I think it's an extremely competitive field. So you're you're expecting to not be at full strength for that August 20th game, not only because the final is that day, but even if you don't have players in that final, the semis five days earlier. And sometimes, as you were alluding to, it takes a couple of weeks before these players are fully recharged physically and mentally where they're ready to even, you know, come back in for spot minutes for their club teams, right? They're not, they're not going full tilt, full 90 a week after playing in the world cup. This is some hardcore stuff here for these athletes um, and, and a lot of pressure. So North Carolina on August 20th, that's a regular season game. That's one that counts. Uh, that's, that's at home at Providence park. Then you go on the road. Really? To that, that, that game really yeah. counts, right? I yeah, mean, that's, it really does. That's yeah, the top because, two teams in the table. <laughs> yeah. At that point, it will still be the case because yeah. most teams will not have played a regular season match by that point. It will have been this little stretch of, of challenge cup matches. So that's huge, right? And then a team that's right there in the mix, Washington, you go on the road to play them the following week. That game in Louisville is probably the most winnable of those three. That's on September 2nd. That could be the return of those World Cup players, but the more likely one is September 16th, way out, uh, a two-week break after that Louisville match against O.L. Reign. And and we're running through schedules here and, and being very, you know, list oriented so far in this podcast but yeah this but how huge are those three games i mean those those three three games are are very plausibly the season yeah yeah because then if you you know aren't getting the results out of those three games you could be probably in a hole spot in the table yeah you you could be or if you do you're probably dominating because you've you've, you've just knocked off two prime contenders uh yeah and 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 you're probably not just atop the table but you're clear a little bit and so, yeah. I mean, those three games could very, very plausibly be the season for the Thorns. It could. And and that's why the development, as we've been talking about, matters with these Challenge Cup games. Because if you're in poor form, if you've got players that, you know, aren't necessarily playing at their best or, or um, mentally aren't feeling as strong as they could be um, going into those regular season matches, no matter who you're folding back in, whether it's Rocky and Hina first, which is likely... Um, or the U S gets, you know, upset in the group stage and you're bringing back Soph and, and crystal early, uh, or Canada doesn't perform as well as expected. And you got, uh, Christine Sinclair coming back, whatever the mix is like, it's not going to be everybody for those three in all likelihood. And, um, the three prior the, and the challenge cup games have an, a greater importance because of that, because, you know, you're going to need Sam coffee to keep doing what she's been doing. You're going to need, better defensive shape with, you know, Mangus and, and Hubley at the back and Quika and, you know, Klingenberg and um, the midfield shape with, with uh, Moultrie, you know, has to continue to to connect well with the attacking players. Izzy Dequila is a young player that's going to have to step up. Raina Reyes, another one. Um, all of these individuals, this is not just going to be, you know, a free for all, you know, whatever stretch where, you know, yeah, you know, we don't have everybody, so it's okay. And that's, you know, by no means the attitude of this team, but they can't let it slip into into dangerous territory because these things are fickle, right? You know, you want to you want to build a dynasty with this Thorns group, right? You want to win multiple championships with Sophia Smith at the head of your organization. Send Christine Sinclair off into the sunset whenever she decides to retire with another ring or two. Um, if you want that, if you want to create this, you know, historic NWSL dynasty which they very much have the players capable of creating it. Um, these type of moments, these these little stretches that people might overlook are the ones that define those dynasties, that create them, that solidify them. And that's what's coming up. That's what's coming up. They better be ready. <laughs> so that uh, there, there's a break right now for the Thorns. Um, 
Enjoying but some they, some some well deserved uh, vacation, I think. Uh, yes, uh, Eric Williamson and Kelly Hubley, the the first family of of Portland soccer. Uh, I think often in Hawaii, it looks like on Instagram, enjoying some some time away. Very jealous, yeah. living their best lives. Yeah, very cool, and and that's part of the Thorns break, but also you know Eric. Eric's on the recovery and, and he gets to enjoy the the beauty of hiking in Hawaii by the looks of it. That's that's pretty awesome. So, yeah, that's all, all outstanding stuff uh, that that is that is the vacation news on the Timbers Inn that is far less dramatic than the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little less a uh, little less tense when it comes to, you know, Eric enjoying the sunshine in, in Hawaii. Um and let you know what let's let's make that the yeah, unfortunate I, and awkward segue. I I I, I, uh, I feel like I like awkward. I feel like I set you up very nicely. <laughs> it's it's awkward for the people involved. Maybe not awkward for me. Uh, <laughs> Shouldn't to, be awkward to, for Eric. Go have a great time. <laughs> yeah, do it. Um, but yeah, he's not the only Timbers player that is not a uh, stateside or I guess not uh, not on, on the, the mainland. <laughs> not uh, not on the mainland right now. Uh. Santiago Moreno is in Colombia. Last I had been told by sources close to him, and that uh, is an extension of the situation after he requested a transfer. He did not show up to training this week. He didn't travel with the team to Colorado for this, you know, resumed second half postponed match, which had an eight day halftime, which uh, is hilarious. The longest MLS debut in history for Victor Griffith, for Victor Griffith who, yeah, yeah. Who, who was has been involved in this game for quite some time. I uh, got a yellow card in his debut, so in, on, in on, the book on the, the on the score sheet. There you go, which is better um, than you can say for either team. <laughs> yeah, congrats to Victor though on on the debut. You know, it's always exciting when a young player gets that opportunity, and you know he's somebody that you know people around the organization have talked uh, very positively about as as having potential to be a regular first team guy in the future. So. Um, you know, congrats to Victor and, um, otherwise that match was pretty ugly. The, uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about, about the match itself. Staying on the Santi subject though, um, you know, since we last recorded this podcast, uh, Gio Savarese had his first media availability following Santi's transfer request. Uh, he essentially denied that, he and Santi have any issues uh, in terms of their relationship. He actually insisted that they're very close uh, and they talk all the time and that he, you know, talked to Santi essentially right after this story came out. Um, Gio claims that Santi said that uh, nothing that was in the article was anything that he said. And that's true, but <laughs> Santi is still in Colombia. He still <laughs> he still did definitely make a transfer request in that he he you know had a conversation according to multiple reliable sources that I had my reporting. Um, and the Timbers haven't he, denied that. Yeah, and the Timbers have not denied that he has. They they made their statement saying, you know, they they you know want to get as good a value out of him as possible that, you know, he's important to the club, all, all the stuff that you have to say, of course, as, as the org, but yeah. Um, you know, it's, this is also coming on the heels of him being benched in for the first half uh, against Colorado uh, after a game in Minnesota in which Gio Savarese publicly uh, questioned the effort of unnamed, but I think we can probably venture a guess uh, as to uh, uh, of some players. Uh, I mean, look, I I understand that Gio doesn't want to sort of publicly acknowledge a rift between him and any player, let alone players. Uh, and, you know, I, I sympathize to some extent with the position that he's in because he's not getting a lot of cover from others in the organization. Uh, he's kind of out there on his own uh, right now. And... So I I understand why he would not want to make a big deal of a rift between him and and Santi in particular in this moment. But like the facts just are what they are, right? If if Santi at least thought his relationship with Gio was great, he wouldn't be in Colombia right now. Plain and simple, he would be at training uh, if that relationship was was as strong as as Gio is letting on. 
Uh, and look, you know, I, I, I get why Gio is saying what he is, but we also need to take a larger look at the facts. And I, 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 I disagree with those who are suggesting, no, this is just about contract negotiations and stuff like that. Look, there have been lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of contract negotiations that have gone on at this club and in every other club. They don't usually go like this. Uh, and frankly, if all that was happening is Santi was trying to leverage a better contract and he was otherwise happy in Portland, it wouldn't be going this way because this would be an insane approach to that. It would be a self-destructive approach to that. And so there is right, definitely and, more and, going on there. And Santi is keenly aware of that. I don't think it's a scenario, um, you know, some folks might put a tinfoil hat on and say, you know, his people are making him stay in Colombia so that he can put additional pressure on the organization to, to give him the money that he wants. That's not is what is happening. Here. No, um, there, there is more to this that will continue to reveal itself in the coming days. And I will say this, that, you know, this inherently is primarily about a contract, right? You know, it, it may have other underlying factors. And, you know, one of them, according to the reporting that I've done is the potential rift is the potential, um, you know, issues between, whether it's coaches or, or just, you know, geo specifically or, or whatever is, is happening right now. Um, you know, I, I hear geo say that, that he and Santi talk a lot and I believe that I, I think that geo has a unique and specific relationship with a lot of the Latin American players that, you know, he might not have with other guys that, you know, being able to communicate in their language, having his own South American background um, and, and, that that matters, right? He he has had strong relationships with other players of of that background in the past. But all that being said, you know it's it's not the first time that something with a player like this has bubbled up. Um, we've we've talked ad nauseum about the fact that there were issues with Eric Williamson publicly, there were issues with Alias Ivicic publicly, uh, and privately there I'm sure have been other issues from you know rumblings that that we have heard on that front. And it's normal um, to some extent to have some of this stuff, right? I and, mean, it's, and it, and it's, it it's a normal. locker room, but this has been way more public than is normal. It's been way more sort of charged, uh, and adversarial than is typical. Uh, and I, you just can't ignore that. I mean, you, you can't, you can't just chalk this up to being, you know, a bit of a, a an outlaw agent, or anything like that. Agents work for players, not the other way around. Uh, and yes, agents can have influence and agents can influence tactics and things like that, but agents work for players. Yeah, there are, there are competing motivations here. Undoubtedly there always is agents want to get as much money as possible for the players, but also want to have transfers happen because agents get a cut out of transfers. That's obvious that that is Obviously, not necessarily a motivation in this specific situation, but it is a motivation generally out of out of you know soccer you know agents. But if making the, these type of situations, but happen. if Santi didn't there want to be also, transferred, you know where he wouldn't be? He wouldn't be in Colombia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like the the denial aspect of of the conversation with Gio was the most interesting to me because um, I can understand the the feeling of you know not wanting to you know, have your reputation put, put out on the line in this way and, and have people criticize your ability to relate to players and, and to, you know, build these relationships and, and to create what you believe is a false pattern between the issues that have been very public and very real between you and players and you having an issue period as a coach, not, not maybe being the right person for the job as some people have, have discussed. But there is no denying the the reality of the situation that he's not there, that he has been repeatedly discussing with Ned Grabavoy the desire for an improved contract, and the reality that the two sides, according to to my knowledge, are extremely far apart in terms of the number. Now you could you could argue whether the the numbers one side wants are more realistic or the other, or you know how constrictive MLS rules might be to to making 
said improvements or how, how you may have put yourself in a bind by paying certain players a certain amount and not other players a certain amount, keeping guys around. There's a lot going on here, right? But there is no denying the reality that this is a fraught situation and that the, the player and the team are not in a good place that Santi is probably not going to see the field for the Timbers uh, again very soon. There's a potential that he ever? might not see the field for them ever again, that he might get traded before this window's over and the Timbers get less value out of him than they want. Uh, and he go, goes and plays for some other MLS team to try and reset his career. That's a very real reality. And, you know, there's no con- concrete rumors that have been attached to this yet. It's very early and very raw right now and and that's the last thing that the timbers want to do right they want to keep santi they want to develop him and and have a chance to move him to, to europe as as he has desired but his play isn't helping that his situation now not being with Certainly the team not, not showing up very much not helping that he's he's probably going to face some disciplinary measures whether it's a fine or suspension or both because of, course, of everything obviously. that's happened. Yeah. That, that's that's like a no-brainer. The the team has to do that because that's a deterrent for <laughs> other players to to go this route and, and negotiate this way if that is what's happening. So there's it, a lot to unpack. Yeah, sure. there's there's a lot to unpack, but I and I I understand and respect where Gio's coming from and in in pushing back uh on on the on the idea of a rift between him and the players. Uh but we've had three of these public dust-ups between player and coach in the last year. That's a lot. And are those entirely related to the relationship with Geo in, in each instance? I don't think we can say that, but we know that that's been a factor at least in each of the three. That's just no real interpretation to be had other than that. that those are just the facts. And that's a lot. We also know that over that period, the team has not performed well. And when you watch the games, I mean, you watch this game against Colorado. These are two teams that should be, should be really desperate for points right now, right? I mean, these both, both of them need them real bad because they're both in a really precarious position facing the humiliation. And I'm going to call it that the abject humiliation of not making the playoffs in this extremely forgiving MLS playoff format. And so they both need those points. Did you see two teams that were desperate to take all three points out of a game that they both could have and should have had realistic ambitions of taking three points? Did you see that? No, no, honestly, (laughs) I didn't like there were individual players who on, on who were engaged. I think, we're engaged. Yeah. Frank Bully on the Timbers was one that played. Cole Bassett, I thought was, Korea. was, was getting after it pretty hard for, for Colorado. Yeah. I, I, I agree. You can find players who were, who were putting it in and, and were, were looked like Brilliant. they had that ur- urgency, but yeah, from a team wide perspective, absolutely not. <laughs> Those were not two desperate teams and you could see it. I mean, the Timbers late on were, were taking their time, right? They seemed pretty satisfied with the draw, even though, the table says they absolutely should not have been satisfied with the draw. That was a draw that did not work for either team. Nobody won, literally. Uh, but also, like in the, in, in the grander scheme, nobody won. Because both of those teams needed three points out of that game, and they n- nobody looked particularly motivated by it. I mean, we had sort of the hot mic moment after the game. And and again, it was, A, very funny. Uh, the, it, it sounded like on, on, on the sort of coach's handshake moment that, Geo and you heard this fairly clearly said something like what a waste of time uh and 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 Robin Frazier came back with with a word that I think we we will not say on this family show uh but it rhymes with spit oh uh, <laughs> and uh but you know so sort of acknowledging agreement and like I get it a that's funny uh and that's enjoyable b I get it because that is similar to how I I felt about the game and all I did was sit on my couch for 45 minutes Geo had to like get on a plane, fly for two and a half hours, stay overnight. Like he had to do do all that stuff. So I get 
why he felt that way after the they, game. They might have they might have flown back right after in all likelihood. But, Still but had to stay way, one night because they flew out the what, day before. What a pain. Yeah. Yeah, what a pain. A, a lot of effort for something that was not particularly satisfying. So I understand the sentiment. <laughs> But one man's waste of time is another man's badly needed opportunity to get three points. And and that wasn't the sentiment that, that we caught in that uh, in, in that hot mic moment. And so, you know, I mean, <laughs> when you zoom out and look at these things from a, the forest level to make a bad timbers pun. You see all of these markers of a pretty clear disconnect between the team's leadership and the coaching staff in the locker room. And whether it's the, the, the public dustups or, or the poor results, or frankly, just the pretty middling effort in, in games where you would expect some desperation, all of those point in one direction and it's not a good direction. Uh, And I'm not here to say that, that it's entirely Gio's fault. I don't think that. I'm not here to say that I think Gio Savares is a bad coach. I also don't think that. Uh, I think he could not have accomplished the things that he has accomplished in Portland if he was an incompetent soccer coach. He's he he is a coach who has good ideas and who's coached good teams and done well. Uh, but this isn't working, and I think that is very clear to the point where you kind of just have to shrug at efforts to sort of deny that. <laughs> right and and you know i mean th- that that those statements just sort of don't withstand the test of comparison with the facts uh and and that's unfortunate but it, it it's where we are and it leads to i think pretty timely questions about what the timbers are going to do to fix that and i i don't know the answers to those questions but i'm 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 waiting with bated breath to see what they are this game against columbus feels like an axis point in their season, right? Like there's a lot of layers to it. There's been this break. The team seemed kind of disengaged in the second half of that Colorado match. Columbus is missing enough of its key players and people, whether it's Chicho Arango or their head coach is also going to be missing uh, for this match to where you feel like at home on Diego Valeri night, on the night they are honoring the club's greatest player of all time and putting him in the ring of honor, that if you're not getting a result out of this match, if you come out and lay an egg against Columbus and lose, or you have an uninspiring draw, which there have been many of this season, uninspiring draws, whether they're 0-0 or not, Boy, have there been a lot of zero zero ones, though. Good lord! I mean, the Timbers are averaging a goal a game. <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's been rough in some of those. But look, if you don't get a result out of that match, questions are going to continue to be asked at an even louder volume than they were before. And you arrive at a point in your season where it's like, all right, is this thing is this thing cooked? Are are we done? Because Diego Valeri is going to provide. I would hope for some, if not all of these players, some motivation, right? You look at a guy like that who did it, did it right. Um, from a, from a personal perspective, from a a playing perspective, he, he embodies what is great and has been great about this franchise in the past. And fans have brought this up online. And I think it's a, it's a fair point that, you know, the product that is out on the field right now is in no way honoring the legacy of somebody like Diego Valeri. It's, it's, you know, people like Diego Valeri almost feel like a past for the Timbers, like a, a could have been type of person where at his time during his era, they were class of MLS. They, they were what is possible about building a fan base, a community around a team, um, a consistently highly competitive team. Um, In the last two years after that MLS Cup appearance in 2021 have in no way lived up to that. I think particularly the last 10 games of this season have been really rough. You know, you've got one win in that stretch. One. 
And you just had four consecutive games against teams that are below that extremely forgiving playoff line. Yeah. And they got two points out of those four games. Yeah, Not so great. You know, you know, people can can, you know, complain about us, you know, being negative and, you know, ragging on the on the timbers here and there. But the but facts look, are negative. The facts right now are are, as you have said before, extremely negative on the field. So and and the standards are higher too. It, look, it's not like this is like the Rapids who are just constantly, you know, circling the drain and, and don't really seem as a franchise to have a whole heck of a lot of ambition to contend, right? This is a Timbers team that purports itself to continue to be the class of MLS, to continue to be one of those franchises you look at as an example. And, you know, we've talked about it before. They're getting passed up. There, there's other teams that are investing more that are, you know, contending and competing more that, you know, don't have as much organizational upheaval as this franchise does. And straight up right now, like it, things are, things are shaky over there in terms of the on-field results, in terms of public sentiment toward the team. Um, You know, butts are still in the seats. You know, they're still selling out the big games. The Timbers army is loud. They're supportive. But it's tenuous, right? This, the, we talked about, you know, little forgettable moments for the Thorns that, you know, could be the difference between building something great and not. For the Timbers, it's about keeping something great alive in order to, to maintain the level that you purport to be on. And, and you know, it doesn't all come down to this Columbus game where Diego Valeri's there. <laughs> And if you don't win in front of Diego Valeri, everybody's going to riot and it's going to be just, you know, all hell's going to break loose for the team and everybody's going to get traded and whatever. The sky will not fall if they lose to Columbus. But cracks will appear in the ceiling. I mean, they're already there. They're already a whole heck They'll of a grow lot a of little them, bit, <laughs> but they're going to get pretty deep and you're going to you're going to worry about your foundation here. Yeah, I think. You know, first of all, this weekend is a, a really important opportunity to honor the kind of athlete who comes along, you know, only a very few number of times in a lifetime for any any sport uh, or in any city, right? I mean, Diego Valeri doesn't get better than that. He was superlative on the field, won an MVP, won an MLS Cup you know, superlative on the field. We could go on and on. He also was just the, you know, most positive force in terms of a representative of the club and a member of the community, a leader of the community that a, a sport professional sports team could ever like dream to have. And, and so a player like that and a person like that, uh, only comes along very, 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 very rarely. And, you know, I remember uh, early in the season, uh, I think you were, you were on vacation and, and our good friend Bill Oram was, was here. And, and he sort of asked me whether I thought Evander could fill the kind of role that Diego Valeri filled. And this isn't, this, and it still is not any any comment about the Evander's quality on the field. I, I think Evander's uh, debut season has been okay, and I think there's lots of reason to believe that that there's still unexplored potential there. And so I, I I am not by any means giving up on Evander, but a Diego Valeri is so rare <laughs> that it's. Just, I mean, that's just a, a wildly unreasonable and unrealistic expectation to put on any player who comes in and that's why it's important to celebrate him and, and, and to, to literally cement his status as, as a legend in, in in this club and as the gold standard of what people want this club to be and to represent. And so it's important to to give him his flowers, so to speak. But the juxtaposition is also telling. And I think it is important, <laughs> frankly, 
for the Timbers to put in a good performance, not just like in a do it for Diego kind of way, although do it for Diego, for God's sake, do it for Diego, if nothing else. But also to show that 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 standard still exists within the club and that that is something that they're still at least trying to live up to. Because let me tell you, if if they they introduce Diego Valeri extremely deservedly into the ring of honor before the game, and then the Timbers go out and put in a lifeless, uninspired performance against the Columbus crew, that's going to show. Like, that juxtaposition is not going to be lost on anybody. Uh, and And it will become emblematic of the deterioration in the club since Valeri left. So I think this game's important for, for, for that reason, if nothing else, uh, because I think there are a lot of people that are looking to the club right now to see if from leadership all the way on down, this is the kind of club that still holds itself to the standard that a Diego Valeri represented. And I think there's a lot of well-founded doubt about that. And and just as this game is is not going to cause the sky to fall, if the Timbers go out and put in a great performance and they win it, it's also not going to single-handedly save them. But the symbolism will be will be important. And and so I I, I hope as I always hope, I would much rather be talking about a good team <laughs> but <laughs> I, I i i hope the timbers come out and put in a good performance for for that reason because i think it's it's going to be it's an important moment for them to give fans and supporters a a, a reason for hope in the future uh, and and for something uh going forward but if they do not and this is this is the, the flip side of that i i think that symbolism will be not lost on anybody just some some housekeeping on the details. Also, still there. waiting on the Diego Valeri statue. Let's get let's yes, get going on also, that. Yeah, oh, there there also should be a statue. I agree with you, um, but perhaps maybe there will be a, a pair of them with with the both of the Diegos out out there instead of that kind of weird and, and not to you know insult the artist or anything, but that face thing that's out on on the northwest corner of the, the stadium. Maybe right there, put put uh, the Diegos just both doing something really cool. Um, why not? But regardless, the the you know the schedule for Saturday, you know, you got the seven thirty p.m. kickoff. The unveiling of Diego Valeri's name in the Ring of Honor will be pregame. Um, I would expect Apple TV to air that, although I I cannot guarantee anything based on how previous broadcasts have gone. But given his importance to MLS and the fact that you know he works for the network. Uh, I think that they would definitely make time to to have that on their pregame. You have to have MLS season pass to watch it, though. So if you haven't opted into one of those free trials yet, you're one of the final holdouts. Um, this would be probably the time to utilize it, uh, particularly because I, I think those free trials last a decent amount of time. So you'll get a little more out of it. This is not an advertisement. I'm just telling you what to do to watch this if you can't get out to the game itself. Um, one note that I found interesting in my reporting on, uh, you know, this, this ceremony is that the, you know, the championships and the conference championships that were, uh, written on, on the East side of the stadium, uh, in the area next to the ring of honor, uh, for both the thorns and the timbers, those have, those have been taken out. So, the way that that side of the stadium is going to work now, my understanding for the future is that there will be the Timbers ring of honor on one side. And right now there's going to be a, a red segment that is empty, but I've been told that that will be the thorns ring of honor. Uh, and you can probably future home guess, of Christine Sinclair. Yeah. I was going to say, you can probably <laughs> guess who the very first name is going to be uh, once she hangs up the boots uh, in that ring of honor, uh, Christine Sinclair. Definitely would I would yeah. guess be the first name up there. But um, so that's a little change in Providence park that you're going to see as a result of, of uh, Saturday night's festivities. And then, you know, the, the second 
aspect of, of the night will be at halftime, uh, the surviving ring of honor um, members and families of those who have passed away will be there with Diego and his family for additional, um, you know, festivities at, at halftime to, to honor Diego and welcome him into that group. Uh, first MLS era timber to, to enter the ring of honor first Latino member, first South American member of, of that group and someone who is representative of, you know, a new era in MLS. And and he talked about it in the story that um, I wrote that's on Oregon live.com, a, a little feature on Diego. I had a chance to chat with him ahead of, of Saturday and that really matters to him, you know, being somebody that is representative of South American players, but also who played a big role in ushering in this new era where, you know, South American talent, young players look at the league differently now because of guys like Valeri. They, they have come in and shined and been stars. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the, the foundation that guys like Valeri laid. So it's, it's not just about the Timbers. It's about, you know, the league more broadly in American soccer and it's, it's past it's present and, and what to you know look at for the future. Just don't embarrass us in front of Diego, okay? That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Diego. Maybe maybe they can um, maybe they can sign Diego to a, a temporary contract and throw him out. In there what capacity the, would be interesting? Yeah, that would be that would be. Uh, <laughs> maybe he can be available for selection. Uh, just just to give him a, a send off. But uh, one other detail, you know, for folks that may be interested. Speaking of Diego Valeri wearing a Timbers jersey. The testimonial match that had been previously discussed but delayed and you know it, you know uncertain for a while. Uh, Diego told me that they are targeting January of 2024 for that match, where the Timbers and Ooh, Lanús cold. from Argentina. Yeah, that'll be a little cold outside, but uh, preseason of of 2024 is what they're hoping for uh, for that. So Diego would play one half for the Timbers and one half for his boyhood club and and the club that he played his final season of pro soccer in, um, in Lanus, you know, that'll, that'll be a fun night, highly anticipated over the, over the years. Uh, and, and another opportunity to honor Diego, you know how you should also honor him in my view, bring that dude into the front office as, as you have said many times before, um, that's a guy you want around in Portland for, for the future. Once, once if he, if he doesn't like the broadcasting thing and wants to, to get back in soccer in some way, there's your avenue. The door should be open uh, to, to, to that conversation. I have no idea what, what Diego's ambitions are. He seems to be enjoying and doing very well with the, uh, in, in, in his fledgling broadcasting career. And if that's what he wants to do, then, and, and, and that's making him happy, then, then phenomenal. But uh, you know, I mean, he, he is the rare kind of player that if he ever wants to return to the club, that door remains open and, and should remain open. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. That'll wrap it for us this week on soccer made in Portland. Uh, more to talk about in the coming weeks to be sure. Uh, follow us on Twitter at soccer made in PDX at Chris Reifer and at Ryan T Clark. Um, like us, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review if you so choose. Um, been liking all the reviews we've been getting lately. Keep them up. Love it. Positive or negative. Don't care. We want to know how you feel. So, uh, thanks again, y'all. And we will see you next week.